Okay, so let's start. Hello everyone uh, from near and far. Um, we have people from all over the US and all the way to Europe. So I welcome you to our virtual roundtable on populism in Europe and the European Union. And we have wonderful guests that I'll introduce in a second. But um, first, I wanted to welcome you. My name is Marcus Thiel. I'm Associate Professor in the Department of Politics and International Relations in um, Florida International University, which is uh, Miami's large research university, a public university. And as such, I welcome you to our talk, which will last about one hour, 15 minutes. Before I introduce our panelists, and then they're gonna start sharing more information with you and then we're going to answer some question and the last 15 minutes really of this session are um, meant for you where you can ask um, questions but please since you are muted put your questions that you may have into the Q&A chat box that you should be seeing on your screen on the bottom but before I do that um, I just want to very quickly open it up um, that you know, populism is obviously an important issue nowadays, um, especially given the rise of COVID and all the other peripheral repercussions that we've seen through that. Um, populist parties of various stripes, sometimes from the left as well as from the right, succeeded in riding a wave of anger over corruption, over um, the sort of mismanaged outcome of some democratic transitions in Central and Eastern Europe over the migration waves, um, the Brexit fragmentation, the lingering Euro crisis, and of course, the European Union's liberal cosmopolitan shared model of governance. These populist leaders, either if they're in the opposition or in government, um, you know, they are often uh, master the anti-establishment rhetoric to perfection. Think about Italy's uh, Deputy Prime Minister Matteo Savini, or Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban. And they are often sometimes supported by external um, actors such as, for example, Russia. Plus, they use skillfully social media for any kind of dis or misinformation campaigns. So this um, important topic is going to be served today by a wonderful panel of experts and which offers a discussion and food for thought about, you know, the current status of populism, what can be done and what will the future be looking like. Again, um, I will introduce now the panelists, then we're going to answer some questions and then please don't forget if you have any questions, put them in the Q&A chat box on the bottom so we can answer them in the remaining 15 minutes at the end. To my panelists. Let's first start us, uh, ladies first, with Professor no Noemi Marin. Welcome, Noemi. Noemi Marin, she is professor in the School of Communication and Multimedia Studies at Florida Atlantic University. Professor Marin is also a native of Romania, and she teaches classical and contemporary political rhetoric, public intellectuals in post-communism, and gender in communication in her department. She's also a Fulbright instructor on intercultural communication in Southeastern Europe. And her research examines the relationship between culture and the rhetoric of resistance in Eastern and Central Europe. She is also the executive editor for the Journal of Liter Literacy and Technology. And some of her recent publications include the books about the rhetorics of 1989, 1989 and the resurgence of history, as well as a number of contributions in journals such as East European Politics and Societies or Advances in the History of Rhetoric. Welcome, Professor Marin. Second, I have Professor Marcel Lewandowski. Professor Lewandowski is a DAAD, Visiting Assistant Professor at the Center for European Studies at the University of Florida. Um, the DAAD, by the way, is the German Academic Exchange Service. Um, his research and teaching focuses on comparative politics with special regards to party and party systems, populism in Europe, obviously, and the political uh, system of Germany. He received his doctoral degree in 2013 from the University of Bonn in Germany and then was um, a lecturer at the Lufana University of Lüneburg and later on worked as a lecturer at the University of the Federal Armed Forces in Hamburg. His most recent publications among those are um, Populist Politicians, 
democratic, democratic dissatisfaction and perception of representation, and the upsurge of right-wing populism in Germany. So welcome, Professor Lewandowski. And last but not least, our own um, ambassador, Dr. Martin Palusch. Um, Martin Palusch is a SIPA, the School of International Public Affairs at FIU, SIPA Senior Fellow, and he is director of SIPA's Vashak Havel Center for Human Rights and Democracy. Ambassador Palusch received his PhD in chemistry from Charles University, Prague in 1973, and then also went on to study philosophy and social sciences and received his PhD in international law in 2000 at Masaryk University in Brno in the Czech Republic. He was one of the first signatures, signatories of the 1986 Charter 77 and served as a spokesperson for the dissident human rights group. He was also a founding member of the Civic Forum um, then was elected to the Czechoslovakian Federal Assembly in 1990, served later on as Deputy Foreign Minister for the Czech Republic, and was then asked by President Václav Havel to represent um, the Czech Republic as ambassador in Washington, D.C. from 2002 to 2005. Following this appointment, he was then ambassador of the Czech Republic to the United Nations, where he served in New York from 2006 to 2010. He has also taught at Charles University in the Czech Republic, and among his many publications are, for example, um, the report on democratization in Central and Eastern Europe, totalitarianism and authoritarianism in the Encyclopedia of Violence, Peace and Conflict, and more recently, Common Sense and the Rule of Law in, I guess, the journal, Philosophy, Literature and Politics. Welcome, Ambassador Palusch. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming, for being here. Um, I would now want to ask our first panelist, Professor Lewandowski, to share a little bit of information, I think with the PowerPoint, so if our tech folks can make sure the PowerPoint is working, um, about populism and the definition of populism, what populism really is. Thank you, Professor Lewandowski. All right, uh, you should all be able to see uh, my screen right now. Um, thank you very much for the kind invitation. Um, and for the uh, opportunity to share some thoughts on populism with you. The question I'm pretty much dealing with here uh, in this short introduction is, why exactly are we uh, talking about populism when we're observing uh, democratic backsliding? Um, and uh, my argument is that we do so because populism has a lot to do with democracy, or to be more precise about it, Populism is in a way of, um, is a illiberal normative orientation to democracy. Um, what does that mean? Um, I will shed some light on that um, in this short introduction. Um, so I always share uh, this slide here um, and the uh, little picture that you see on the left, and I do share it uh, because it's actually a pretty horrible picture to look at uh, because you're actually thinking, what exactly am I, am I seeing here? What you are seeing here is a contribution from one of the standard uh, uh, books or contribution to the research on uh, populism or the populist radical right by Kaus Muda in 2007. And what he has done here is he collected all the terms that were being used in research to address one and the same family of parties that we know uh, mostly um, um, address as populist radical right. So it is due to Kaas Muda that we now have a concept um, in order to define um, this family of parties. I will tell you a little more about this concept in, the, uh, in, uh, in a second. Um, what I would like to add here is um, actually some transparency. This is not the only definition of populism that is out there. There are other definitions, for example, by Laclau, um, there are critical remarks on Kasmudis' definition, uh, for example, by Paris Aslanidis and others, um, but this is one of the standards that we work with in empirical research. So populism, um, from this perspective, is a thin ideology that is uh, defined by a Manichaean worldview that divides the society into two homogeneous groups, the people and the establishment. Whether we talk about left or right populism depends on the host ideology that populism is linked to. So what does that mean? Populism as a thin ideology, um, as said, 
defines society as being divided into two groups, the people being a homogeneous body that is defined by a common political will. Um, Mota refers to that by uh, the term volonté générale, um, which he uh, takes from Rousseau, of course. Others, such as Jan Werner Müller, describe it, um, I would say even a little more precisely, as Volksgeist, because um, the populace claims to know the people's will not by negotiation, um, but by, um, by nature, so to say. On the other hand, um, there is the political establishment. Now, the political establishment is a homogeneous group too, and it is in opposition to the people because populists claim that the establishment is self-interested, aloof, um, does not know what the people think, does not feel by, like the people do, and so on. So when it comes to the question of what populism has to do with democracy, populism is pretty much the idea that democracy is all about the unrestricted execution of the sovereignty of the people. I'll come back to that in a minute. What is important here as well is that populism, um, whether we talk about a left or right variant, is defined by the outsiders that populism de populists define um, not as uh, being a part of the people. So for example, um, for radical right populists, this would be immigrants or refugees or cultural minorities or, or of any kind. In some countries, this would also include um, the LGBTIQ uh, community. And with left-wing populists, the logic is in a way the same. So there are huge similarities in a way um, to uh, uh, populist right parties, but the outsiders they are defined are different. So for example, they refer to the wealthy, the company owners, the entrepreneurs, uh, and so on. Now let's make it a little more complicated with regard to what populism has to do with democracy. In order to understand what populism is as a normative orientation towards a illiberal uh, democratic ideal, I would like to um, give you a specific view on what democracy is. So um, this is actually uh, taken from um, uh, two chapters by Canavan in 2002 and um, Mini and Surel in the same edited volume, uh, also in 2002. And what this says is that understanding democracy means understanding it as comprised of two um, pillars. One pillar is the so-called democratic pillar. It's the will of the people, popular sovereignty, any form of participation, for example, um, um, as uh, conducted through elections. But this is not all what liberal democracies are. Modern democracies are defined by a second, the constitutional pillar. And this is the individual right, this is the rule of law, and so on. So why are these two pillars um, important for populism? In order to understand that, we must see that they create such a thing as a democratic paradox. Now, again, there are some scholars that doubt this interpretation too, if you're interested in that. There's a paper by Ax and uh, Romans in 2007. Um, but what it says is that in order to guarantee the continued existence of democracy, the constitutional pillar limits the sovereignty of the people. So, for example, in most democracies, um, constitutional democracies, the people cannot decide by a majority uh, to abolish democracy or to abolish um, uh, individual rights and so on. Now what populism does is they say, well, the people are the only legitimate bearer of democracy. So the, pe the will of the people must be implemented, I would say executed, unchanged. So the rule of law and also the, um, the um, um, proponents of the rule of law, such as uh, justices, uh, such as um, checks and balances, are seen as obstacles to the people's will. So technically, populists are still in a way democratic, but they prefer an illiberal, in a way, anti-constitutional form of democracy. And this is also what we see in uh, the democratic reforms in countries such as uh, Poland and Hungary, but also in a way in uh, uh, maybe in the Czech Republic and Bulgaria, Bulgaria uh, but to a much lesser extent. So. In their communication, then, the institutions of checks and balances are equal to the establishment. Does, that, does this th theory apply to populist parties um, um, in practice? 
In order to give you a short uh, idea whether that is the case, I will share some data from an unpublished paper that I have just uh, conducted. So this is, um, uh, these are two scatter plots. Um, on the left, you see Western Europe, and the right, you see Central Eastern Europe. And you pretty much see all relevant parties of uh, several countries in this region. And on the um, vertical uh, y-axis, uh, we see the degree of popular saliency. So the, strong, the higher the number, the more populous is the party. And on the uh, x-axis, you see the, um, the extent to which a party supports liberal democratic norms. So the lower uh, the number is, the more supportive is the party of liberal democratic norms, and the higher the number is, the less supportive is the party of liberal democratic norms. Now, what's interesting here is that um, actually you see the same pattern in every country, in every region. So in Western Europe and in Central Eastern Europe, um, we see that um, populist parties are pretty much also anti-liberal or against liberal democracy, according to uh, this expert survey data. But what we can also see is that this is not only due to populist, among a populism, among the group of populists, those who are the strongest, again, um, liberal democracy, are the right-wing populists. So for example, FPO and AFD in uh, Western Europe, um, and Fides and uh, SNP and SDS in um, Central and Eastern Europe. However, there's one difference um, that you can see here um, uh, between Western Europe and Central Eastern Europe. In Central and Eastern Europe, in contrast to Western Europe, you get a relatively big group of populist parties that are um, against or not as supportive of a liberal democratic norms that are ideologically rather moderate. And that is an interesting specific of Central and Eastern Europe, for example, that applies to um, the Czech government party um, anno 2011. This is just to give a first insight into what populism is, how we can um, approach it, and what it looks like with regard to the ideology of political parties. Um, thank you uh, for your interest, and I'm looking forward to the other inputs and the discussion. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, next, I would ask uh, Professor Marin to please um, give us a little bit more detail on, I guess, her speciality, which is sort of the rhetoric and discourses, narratives, etc., on populism. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, thank you, Marcus, for uh, inviting us. Literally, this is very exciting. I'm going to read it because I just have some notes here, and then hopefully it will open up for discussion. So, to me, populist discourse is not new. <laughs> its current forms are new or renewed, but I want to state that I agree with uh, Friedrich and uh, Brzezinski that all political discourse carries with it authoritarian dimensions if practiced as such, literally. <laughs> so uh, uh, this is a rhetorical plaque for the need to expand more the deep rhetorical and historical connections of political communication, whether nationally or globally, in order to explain the rise and fall of all authoritarian discourse in different times and in different levels of persuasive success. Populist rhetoric is fundamentally part of authoritarian political discourse. And I would like to highlight briefly some of the dimensions that continue to present potential for reactivation throughout times. But before I start, let's say this. Populist rhetoric is successful from a persuasive standpoint. Whether we examine it or not, it exists with huge number of participants of audience members. Why is that? It does not matter which country, for in the US and in many European countries, for instance, as Marcel had just pointed out, populist discourse captured vast numbers of the respective country's population beyond meaning simply that such discourse is popular, pun intended. Practitioners of populist discourse, not just respective leaders, but audiences turn, turn into participants because they continue to believe in the rhetorical powers of populist discourse. Again, why is that? So I have several minutes to, for my short presentation and I will just go into three main dimensions and hopefully we'll have more discussions on that, of course. So in one of my recent studies on communist rhetoric in Eastern Europe, part of the collection I co-edited on Routledge, Rhetorics of 1989, I think Marcus announced it, uh, I attribute authoritarian rhetoric as part, um, as always part of the praise-blame epideictic genre. Uh, 
not part of deliberative public and political action. So important to say that a large part of political discourse utilizes praise and blame as framework for discourse in the public sphere, engaging pathos and ethos to win over any argumentative framework of political deliberation. Yet in populist rhetoric, praise and blame genre stems from an ideological appeal from authority, from the people's authority, calling for history and nostalgia of the past in terms of national identity to reconfigure the future. This antagonist view between popular and, and, and government, this formula is actually one of the winning strategies in several Eastern European and Eurasian national nations currently, as Marcus just, uh, as I'm sorry, Marcel just pointed out. The appeal for, from authority of the past is act, acting mainly to reconfigure national pride and legitimize political glory of the nation. Here comes to mind Jacob Talman's brilliant in-depth analysis in Myth of the Nation and Vision of Revolution, uh, pointing precisely to the dichotomy, the schism between ideological appeals to support mainly national identity as pride of the nation and the discursive appeals to create awareness of change on basis of civic and civil justice, the latter clearly within a deliberative framework of political action. Similarly, Tismanano's outstanding study on fantasies of salvation explores at length modify versions of the myth of salvation in political discourse in communist times, as well as appeals from authority in the name of national pride. So this is one of the main um, formulas for populist um, justification. Second, the construction of the enemy from uh, which for over a century had been one of the emblematic strategies in communi communist discourse. The construction of enemy when it comes to national identity and national pride brings to it justification for history as a fundamental dimension for political action. Sharing multiple strategies with nationalist discourse, populist rhetoric presents a nostalgic appeal from and for the past, just depending on which political context is to be featured in order to highlight um, themes of people part of the national glory and pride of mother country, people part of the history and the past finding ways to be politically appealing if contrasting within the enemy oppressive forces in this case of the government intending to destroy the well-being of the respective nation state. Both populist and nationalist discourse share suspicion and pride as appeals for the nation when it comes to vigilance towards the enemies of the state, country, etc. A much larger discussion of the differences of construction of enemy in nationalist versus populist versus patriotic rhetoric need attention, but we don't have the time here to explore that. Third, um, since I mentioned in the beginning that populist rhetoric carries allure for its audiences. It's important to examine rhetorically, culturally, and politically, in my view, the pull that comes from an undeniable sense of belonging to the myth of a nation, of a popular nation. The allure and fascination of such discourse brings to its audiences a justified engagement in forceful, powerful and I would say read violent public and political action in the name of participating in and for the history of the nation, an undeniable mythical allure for political gain. Salvation, saviors, as Emilio Gentile presents in his Politics as Religion book, are undeniably promising political actions that justify participants to play a role in the public sphere. So to to recap, if I have, I think I have one more minute. The populist formula for praise and blame politics that does not allow deliberative action in the name of the love of the nation as part of the popular participation. The construction of the enemy as a complex strategy to justify action. And last but not least, the allure, the allure of belonging to the, uh, the myth of the nation, as well as political claims Anti, about uh, anti-government and about the need to rehabilitate, reconstitute and reinstate historical pride in the nation are some of the most um, important discursive aspects that legitimize both the practice of such discourse and its participants' actions in public life. That's my 
I think that's my time. Thank you, thank you. Lots of food for thought. I hope we can um, interrogate some of these notions a little, in a little bit. Um, last but not least, um, Martin, Ambassador Palush, if you would please um, share a little bit of your knowledge. <clears throat> thank you very much for inviting me to this, uh, I think, very timely uh, discussion. Uh, I'm not going to try to play a role of devil's advocate, uh, but still I cannot resist to raise a couple of uh, questions in this context. Uh, first, there is a general, uh, I would say, defense of uh, populists. I hear all uh, again and again that uh, they are somewhat mis misinterpreted uh, by their critiques, uh, that they have something else on mind, and I would like to find out what it is uh, before we start uh, agreeing uh, that uh, their uh, proposals are destructive, dangerous, not very, I would say, promising, etc., etc. I think that uh, first what we need uh, to is to go back to the past and try to put our situation into broader historical context. Obviously, the biggest uh, turning point is 1989. Uh, if uh, I uh, remember that period of time when Czechoslovak anthem was sung uh, uh, by uh, crowds on Wednesday Square, uh, was it populism or was it uh, some other feeling? It was feeling that uh, our identity had been uh, stolen or robbed uh, in the times before, and obviously everybody had uh, some good hopes and expectations. And uh, what we experienced uh, in my country was one of the paradoxes. Uh, Czechoslovakia, a state that was nicknamed the uh, only remaining island of democracy uh, before uh, the Second World War, uh, turned out to be one of the first victims of revolution uh, under the banners of democracy. Uh, I think that just to go very uh, 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 thoroughly uh, through the Czechoslovak discourse or what was called Velvet Divorce after Velvet Revolution uh, should be very important exercise today. I cannot go into details, but there is a lot uh, to be uh, uh, thought through and debated in this context. Czechoslovakia was not the only federation, if you want, uh, that uh, became a victim of that situation. 19, uh, we thought that we would be going back to 1968 or 48, but we turned out to be now uh, back in 1918, not only Czechoslovakia, but also Yugoslavia, uh, for maybe different reasons and different, I would say, process and different outcomes, was another victim of uh, this uh, big transformation of 1989. And obviously, I can also uh, mention the disintegration of the Soviet Union with uh, slightly different um, uh, consequences, different reasons, and so on and so forth. I only want to say is that we need to put whole debate to a larger context if we want to understand it. It's not my defense on populists, but it's actually my call uh, for Democrats to be more thoughtful, uh, to go to deeper levels of our discourse, and not just to be happy with cheap rhetoric that uh, they are good liberal Democrats, they are not, uh, that they are not understood by all these crazy populists that are so easily uh, trapped in, a, I would say, a language exercises of ambitious uh, uh, politicians. Uh, that was my first point. Uh, obviously, uh, we need to think about human rights in this context. But my question would be, is this uh, concept of human rights which we have inherited from enlightenment uh, as a uh, human rights as a catalog of entitlements to be ever expanded again and again is the one that can help us to uh, protect ourselves against populists. I think that uh, maybe my own experience in Charter 77, and I can go back to all these philosophical discussions, uh, try to bring somewhat different concept of human rights. Maybe in connection with the Václav Havel's legacy, human rights as a responsibility, as uh, the willingness to uh, speak for other people, and not just to coordinate myself with the current uh, situation. So again, if we accept this platform, we might be able to start a different, a different uh, debate. Uh, 
populism certainly is not just a European disease of today. It's not only connected with maybe, uh, let's say, uh, the uh, unfortunate traditions of East Central European nations that had been, uh, I would say, brainwashed, debilitated by totalitarian uh, pressures uh, uh, and still are not able to get out of this uh, uh, tradition. Uh, certainly, German debate is very interesting in this concept. You can go here, or not here, but uh, to the United States and look at the American version of populism. Populism is a global phenomenon, it's not just a European phenomenon. Uh, so I think that we need to take all these uh, things into consideration so that we have a balanced uh, discussion uh, about uh, the problem. Uh, obviously, democracy is a uh, system uh, in which uh, individual citizens have a right to say what they want to say and they have a right to choose whatever uh, is uh, their uh, preferred choice. Uh, obviously, uh, these choices are sometimes unfortunate, uh, sometimes dangerous. Uh, we need uh, to be able to warn uh, that certain uh, things can be uh, seen as a maybe uh, way uh, to the hell uh, paved with good uh, intentions. That's what we see all around. Just last point, in the Czechoslovak case, we had an election uh, last uh, weekend, and actually uh, everybody feels that it was a proof that uh, it's not so bad with democracy in the Czech Republic, because uh, there, uh, there was a whole spectrum of uh, entities uh, uh, being, uh, 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 they have created all sorts of coalitions that will now be discussing their regional politics uh, because it was an election to uh, these type of bodies. That it is not so bad with uh, Czech democracy at the moment. Even this ANO movement mentioned uh, by Marcel uh, is not just uh, Mr. Babish's uh, one man show. There are so many interesting people there, and they will now have a chance to think through. Uh, what uh, are they a part of? And uh, last, very last point, the Czech Republic is a small size or medium sized Central European uh, nation and uh, finding itself in certain geostrategic situation and position for ages. And my uh, thesis is as long as uh, our uh, politics will be contained uh, in our small, sometimes uh, provincialist atmosphere of the Czech Republic, we'll be okay. Uh, the biggest problems will come to our democracy as they did in the past, in 1938, in 1968, uh, when uh, geopolitical pressures would uh, make our democracy uh, maybe more difficult to sustain. But uh, I would uh, rather uh, invite populists uh, not uh, to give us uh, their political statements, but open a dialogue, open a dialogue about identity, about our situation uh, in this moment of the world in which we are right now. Great, thank you very much, uh, Martin. Um, now you already touched upon sort of some, the first question that I wanted to ask. And again, I wanna remind everyone to please submit um, question in the Q&A box so we can pick them up in the end around noon when we're going to go for the um, Q&A section. But um, you touch upon some important things. Um, for example, what triggered the rise of populism? I'm focusing more on Europe. Obviously, it's a global phenomenon, as you mentioned. Um, democratic dissatisfaction, that's what I heard in some parts, right? In the case of Europe, it may be also specific events related to EU governance, as well as sort of, you know, maybe the EU's loosening of national sovereignty, right? That I also heard out of some of your presentations. So what triggered the rise of population and is it sort of a general assertion across Europe or do we have to look at sub-regional patterns? What do you think? Anyone, whoever of the three of you who wants to tackle these questions. I'm gonna start with something that I pointed to and it's not that I don't have an answer what triggered, but I do like Martin's um, point that we need to look at context and the con historical context and it's not something as I mentioned also it's not something that it's new it's something that it's it gives different features to it but I wanted to say when you said what triggered one of the things that actually triggered it is a uh, 1918 taking 1989 as a as a let's say as a threshold 
of discourse, of changing of rhetoric. Um, people, peoples need to look at governments and peoples need to respond to governments and people's participation before leaders it's the people, it's the people, funny enough, it's the people, and it's not necessarily the people as we academics label them, but it's the people as the participants who created the need. And we have to look at the need, whether we like it or not. If there is a need in the people for this kind of recapture or re-justifying of public participation. And that was sort of, to me, the claim under which that's one of the phenomena that happened. Thank you. Uh, I think I can add something uh, to that. Um, from an empirical perspective, what stands out is the um, degree of congruence between the supply of the populist parties, uh, not only with regard to their left or right policies in economical terms or with regard to immigration, but also um, considering their um, supply on the issue of democracy. So what both populist parties and the um, voters of populist parties share are specific attitudes towards democracy. So they're in a way anti-pluralist, they're in a way uh, illiberal, and that's pretty much what we call populist attitudes. And I think if we wanna understand the success of these parties, we have to shift away from the idea that this is just protest. It is not. If you look at data uh, on populist attitudes, for example, by Foa and Munch, they have shown several times that, pop, that, that the democratic attitudes in several countries in the world that we perceive as being stable are declining. And at the same time, there's increasing polarization. And pa populist parties can capitalize on that. And this is, not a, this is not a mistake. This is not chance. This is because it provides something with also with regard to democracy, also on immigration and also on the economy, for example, in Southern Europe with the left-wing populists, but also considering democracy that the other parties can't. So they're in a way closing a representation gap. If I uh, may uh, add one uh, point uh, to what I have said. Uh, I remember uh, in uh, 1990 and onwards, uh, maybe the biggest uh, catch word or slogan uh, for us was return to Europe. Uh, it was first uh, demonstrated by the fact that uh, we uh, had to live behind uh, the Iron Curtain, uh, even not being able, not being allowed dissidents, certainly not travel abroad. Out of sudden, the world was open for us and we had some easy direction, even in foreign political area, where we want to return to. It was not clear at that moment that it would be our integration to the EU and NATO. It was still a very initial debate, but it was the clear direction. We wanted to go there. And at the same time, there was a still another discourse that was very weak, but I think important too. I remember uh, when I was uh, surprised once traveling from somewhere to somewhere uh, on the plane, read Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung, you know, with an article written by Bulgarian president, and he was mentioning in the context of our current political process, Edmund Husserl's crisis of European civilization. So I think that uh, the fact that there is something like crisis of European civilization uh, should or not have been so far taken uh, seriously enough into consideration. That uh, on the one hand, we see now maybe more uh, institutionalized uh, the process of European integration, but uh, heavy democratic deficits uh, in the communication between, uh, let's say, Brussels and uh, national capitals, and obviously politics that is transformed into uh, another administration of things and not a participatory process in which individuals can participate. So I think that here you have a, a problem uh, that uh, certainly has given a lot of impulses to uh, populists. Uh, the problem I have with populists is that they are not thinkers, uh, that they are uh, producers of slogans, that they only uh, read minds of people, they want to attract their attention and say what uh, they uh, believe that these people want to hear. Uh, so maybe they are good lips readers, uh, they, are, uh, they can do that, but I think what uh, I think we need now is a courage to think. 
courage to find uh, a, a proper space for a real European discourse. But this re uh, European discourse is taking place in the periods uh, when we have non-European civilizations around, in which we have others that are participating our, in our discourse. If you go to the problem of multiculturalism and even migration, you are immediately there. And so then uh, what is the solidarity, this concept of solidarity, and then uh, populist rhetorics that we need to keep ground, we need to keep ourselves uh, just intact and uh, happy in this world with so many uncertainties. So here we have a problem and not just uh, a reason to be, I would say, uh, angry with populists uh, and uh, uh, some sort of unjustified hope that things will get better. They will not if we are not courageous enough and capable enough, creative enough to think. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, that brings me right to the next point, and I'm glad to see that there are some questions that were uh, coming up in the Q&A that we're going to tackle in a little bit. But um, so you already mentioned sort of these two kind of areas. I would like to know a little bit more. Do populists in the EU um, focus more on, you know, internal others um, that could be, you know, like the political economic elites or the minorities or more at external ones? such as, for example, as was just mentioned, you know, the EU's governance, um, or is it both? Is there like a pattern recognizable? Um, it, it depends on the country. Um, so I would say basically it depends on the region. So classically, um, the, uh, the uh, um, populist appeal of uh, parties in Central and Eastern Europe was, for example, in Hungary, much more irredentist. Um, this is something that we don't see in Western Europe. In Western Europe, populists have focused on external others, uh, which would be immigrants or later refugees. Um, and in, uh, during the refugee crisis, um, there, this has created some similarities between Central, Europe, uh, Central Eastern European populism and Western European populism. Um, so what they do is they mostly focus on external others um, to the extent that some parties even are supportive, for example, of LGBTQI rights um, at this, Pretty much account is is the is the case with um, the LPF, the former uh, Dutch uh, Populist Party, and later on also the PVV. So the PVV, for example, in one man manifesto says homosexuality is part of the Dutch culture, and they mean it in a positive way. But you wouldn't find that with the Front National or the Rassemblement National in French, which is much more conservative when it comes to uh, social values. Um, however, um, I would say that, for example, external actors such as Europe plays, play a, or the EU play a much greater role um, in Hungary or in Poland uh, in their populist parties. To a lesser extent, they're important in uh, Western Europe, but what we can see is when they are mentioned, they are mentioned in a specific way. Um, the, the EU is, for example, framed by the PVV in the Netherlands as the EU DSSR or EUSSR. Um, um, in a similar way, this applies to um, the AFD in Germany um, uh, referring to the EU as a totalitarian state. So the EU is not a supranational institution or system, it's an other um, that threatens domestic democracy. And I think this is important to see, although it is not at the forefront of their uh, manifestos or their ideology these days. Great, thank you. And um, that brings me right to the next question, sort of about you know some of the misinformation or disinformation campaigns, right? And here I'm thinking personally about Russia a lot because Russia has a lot of links to European populists of various kinds. So maybe can you say something, anyone, a bit about the outside influences, uh, in particular Russia, its use of you know misinformation or disinformation campaigns? I guess Noemi, would that be something, Professor Marin? Uh, can I, mean, I ask I just, you a question? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oopsie. Go ahead. Go ahead, Martin. Go ahead. Uh, you know, uh, just uh, following up what Marcus just said, uh, what about uh, the Chinese transformation, let's say, from Maoist uh, internationalism uh, to um, kind of populism or Chinese nationalism, uh, assertive nationalism uh, coined by the current leadership? They all have their own version of populism. Obviously, populism in an authoritarian, totalitarian context is some, somewhat different, um, uh, um, I would say, uh, variety of uh, the same species, uh, but maybe more robust and more dangerous. And we need to 
look also at this direction, then you have a question, is the populism a matter of older generation? Certain version, yes. Uh, but uh, what about uh, younger people? What about populists that are now being uh, bred and uh, having their dialogues in social media? Are there uh, same type of populists like uh, Kaczynski in uh, Poland or are there something different? Great, we have our media expert here, so Professor Morin. Let me get back to your question. And uh, I, I mean, I'm so happy for this panel because it makes me think of even more. I mentioned before in my little um, lecture <laughs> of five minutes that populism and nationalism are connected as part of authoritarian discourse. No question about that. They really are. And we should, there are variations contextually. But your question related to outside influences, I want to say something about the allure of political powers of authoritarian leaders. I mean, I did, I did a, uh, um, a study on Putin and the reconfiguration of the Second World War as the great war that is Russian, not even Soviet, and the transformation of Soviet into Russian right now. And what Marcel was mentioning about different enemies, I mean, the construction of the enemy is not something new. But what it is new is that there is, in populist discourse, the construction of the enemy is not negotiated anymore. It is it's not not an ideological thing. You have to have enemies in order to become a popular leader, <laughs> and because of that, that's not that's not new. <laughs> that's from Aristotle on, and Cicero wrote a book on that uh, before even Machiavelli and others. So, in that sense, um, the, the what is le what is lost about it, and where the the parties, different parties play it differently, is the deliberate, deliberation, the role of di dialogue, the role, the lack of dialogue into identifying the enemies. So um, migration was not part of 1989, literally, but populist tendencies were. Uh, Chinese current discourse is not part of anything about migration. It's part of Hong Kong and the issues of the view of the national myth of how are they seen outside. So yes, there are themes, I think, I would say themes of allure of those that the political leaders play on. And um, the, more, the more stable, I mean, look at Orban, Putin and Trump are three different kinds. I'm not even talking about the Chinese leader, three different kinds of political stability of a populist claim which is powerful, seriously, <laughs> it's that simple. Great, thank you. Um, I mean, I would love to ask you also a question about sort of what can then be done, but I think we have so many questions. I'd, I'd rather get to the audience questions because maybe some of the what can be done can be then clarified later, right? So again, some of, I'm starting from the top. Um, and Jennifer Williams wants to know, I guess again for you, Professor Marin, can you please explain a little bit about the populist use of praise and blame? How that maybe concretely looks. Well, I mean, Martin had probably experienced it most in all his, um, you know, amb ambassadorial meetings where politics does have, does not, there are different things, the creative creator in public sphere of policy making is the legal part, but for the people to justify their actions, for the people to justify alliance to different parties, to different groups, to different themes, whether it's past, it's history, whether it's future, reconstruction or deconstruction or reinvention of the country, uh, new Europe, past Europe, civilized Europe. These are all part of, it's much easier to do a praise blame meaning um, no longer dialogue about it. It's just literally a fundamental highlighting how good we are versus how bad they are. It's that simple and people react to that. That's the frame of epideictic. Again, it's part of political discourse everywhere, but this is one of the fundamental functions. And as Martin mentioned, pop populists are not necessarily ideological theorists. They are just using the power of those two forces. That's it. Thank you. Professor Lewandowski, I think you wanted to also add to Jennifer's question. 
Oh, you're um, mute or mute? So. I, I have a, a problem to hear you. Um, so, um, <coughs> what populists do um, uh, in, in terms of praise and blame is their strategy um, is to delegitimize <coughs> the political establishment. This is what this is all about. So, they claim that only the people are legitimate, um, are legitimate representers of themselves and they are in line with the people. They are in, as, as Karamani has pointed out, in an organic relationship with the people. That's what they claim. So all the praise and blame, and, or especially the blame against the, uh, against the establishment, um, is based on, on, this, uh, on this ideology. Um, so the establishment can be legitimate in representing the people because they're not in contact with them, but the populists are. And this is also why such a drastic language that we see by the populists is justified because those up there are literally the enemies of the people. It's not just criticizing the elite, which is uh, like what normally happens in democracies. You criticize the government for, for their policies. It's delegitimizing the elite. Thank you. Um, Professor Ron Linden uh, has the question that he wants you to talk a little bit more, any of you, um, to address the link between populism and democratic backsliding. Because, you know, is it sort of because populists pull the parties, the governing parties to the right? Is it because they are the appeal of the populists? Um, he mentions France and there are populists, obviously, but there is no democratic backsliding there. So is there a linkage between populism, democratic backsliding in Central Eastern Europe that may not exist? Oh, uh, certainly uh, there is a link between the presence of populism uh, and the states of our democracies. Uh, I would uh, be uh, cautious uh, to qualify or to use the term uh, backsliding as long as the uh, basic rights are respected uh, and uh, uh, constitutional separation of powers uh, is uh, there. Uh, populists certainly are uh, those uh, the parties that uh, like to uh, yeah, maybe uh, certain breaks or impose certain restrictions on separation of powers and even to uh, uh, see uh, that the rights are limited, the access to public space, media, and you can go uh, on and on. The relationship is here, but what I'm trying to say uh, today is uh, that first we need to understand uh, populism uh, so that we can uh, understand the other thing and make uh, right things to do. Uh, no one has yet used uh, the word globalism, globalization. Uh, the fact that uh, external world has been turned into a world of full of enemies is uh, certainly speaks about something. Uh, it speaks about the state of the world today uh, that is maybe uh, experiencing uh, too many uncertainties. Uh, and you, you can start from all these global commons uh, like uh, climate change and now uh, pandemics and uh, the fact that, that uh, migration of population is a very uh, fluid element. Uh, I'm not uh, uh, making any political suggestion uh, what should be done, how to do it. Obviously, one can dream about big things of the past like Kantian ideals of uh, uh, universal hospitality as a principle of civilized world, which is a, a nice and very asymmetric relation between guests and hosts. Hosts and guests are two different categories and it depends on where you are, but you need to cultivate these old ideas and not just to cry uh, that populists are on uh, the rise and democracy is backsliding. Democracy is still here, but obviously the Democrats are somewhat uh, ill today. Thank you, thank you. That leads me to the next question um, from Andre Christian Negut, and I'm just, you know, asking the question as they appear. Um, how do the, you know, increasing development of supranational structures or quasi-federations, ASEAN, the European Union, you know, well, the United Nations is mentioning, how do they, do they increase populism? Because um, I guess he's from Romania. He asked that in Romania, there's a constant anti-EU rhetoric employed to justify what the populists are doing. 
Um, from the perspective of the voter level, um, your skepticism, for example, plays a huge part in uh, the populist vote, at least in some countries. Um, um, if you like, in if you, if you test it against other attitudes, um, the role is smaller than one would think. So um, what that means is that your skepticism is just one attitude among other uh, voters of populist parties. Um, first and foremost, in terms of uh, radical white parties, um, populist attitudes and anti-migration attitudes. Um, however, what I would say is that um, Europe is in a way increasing insecurity about politics. Um, Fritz Schaaf has once mentioned that um, the problem with Europe is that it doesn't cut the chain of legitimacy, um, but it, the chain of legitimacy it gets so long that we can't really assign political decisions to a specific actor. And that might be a problem of why the democratic deficit of the EU is, a, is maybe to a great deal a perceived one, not first and foremost a, 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 an institutional a, existence in a way, um, and populists can capitalize on that. Um, then I would have the next question um, from David Kramer from FIU. Um, I also want to touch upon Gustavo Perez's question. Um, both refer in a way to Hungary and Poland. So Gustavo asking why has Orban been, Prime Minister Orban and Hungary been so successful staying in power? And then David Kramer asking um, with the transatlantic, despite the tense transatlantic relations, um, the current US administration supports leaders in Poland and Hungary. And if I'm correct, also the Russia, Russia has very put in this very close context to Orban. Does the six contribute to the support for populism? If I may, I would uh, certainly, uh, looking at Poland and Hungary, uh, start from their historical experience. Uh, I think that Orban Viktor is an inheritor of certain Hungarian uh, discourses uh, going back to the 19th century, to the First World War, the result of that war, the fact that the uh, Hungarian uh, nation is uh, spread uh, around several states, and I can go on and on. Uh, so I would certainly take this uh, aspect into consideration. Uh, I had opportunity to meet uh, Viktor Orban several times. Uh, certainly everybody is uh, evolving and I'm not defending his uh, somewhat authoritarian tendencies and uh, even his concept of illiberal democracy is uh, uh, something that is uh, dubious but still needs to be uh, uh, thought through. What does it mean? Because uh, obviously I would be more concerned about Viktor Orban's just strategic choices uh, to uh, have a link with a, a Russian uh, company to build their nuclear power plants. Uh, it would be more, for me more worrisome. Uh, otherwise, I'm just uh, relying on uh, the collective wisdom and traditions of Hungarian people uh, that is still there. Uh, the second argument, Hungary is a landlocked country. Uh, Hannah Haren once uh, pointed to a paradox that it was led by Armed, uh, Admiral Horty uh, without having a navy or anything uh, like uh, 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 the situation that admirals should have a role there. The Polish case is certainly different. You have a Polish Catholicism, Polish experience uh, being divided several times, uh, relationships between uh, Poland and Germany and uh, uh, Russia. So I think that I would not underestimate these uh, political, uh, polit uh, these historical experiences. Uh, don't understand me that I'm defending uh, uh, these uh, two countries. But I would be somewhat reluctant to go too far and still would hope and pray for Visegrad cooperation and some sort of common wisdom of countries in the region that were exposed to totalitarianism and now uh, still are neighbors and need to work together. Thank you. I want to, yep, no, before you Mark, come, go I ahead. I want to also and, and emphasize also the role because Isabella Hernandez also asked about the role of the US, right? So what happens if Donald Trump wins the November election? Might that trigger more populist movement in Europe? Thank you. I just wanted to continue a little bit on Martin for two, two, two things very quickly. One is um, there is a continuum to authoritarian discourse, political authoritarian discourse. It takes forms. It takes forms of nationalist discourse. It takes form of populist discourse based on the historical context. Both Poland and Hungary have one thing in common, which is a very solid construction 
of the national identity in opposition to what are the others based on the historical their histories and that is one of the winning arguments in um, in popular in popular and populist both of them popular and populist political uh, life period that's it so it does it's winning because of that too thank you anyone wants to answer the question about the role of the us well i think that transatlantic relation it's important uh, for all European countries. And if we were now talking about, uh, let's say, Central Europeans, yes, uh, of course. Uh, and uh, frankly speaking, uh, I just had an opportunity to speak with uh, Czech Foreign Minister today. And it seems to me uh, that we need to be prepared for both options. Uh, whoever is going to win is going to be our partner uh, for good or bad. Uh, so we hope uh, that the transatlantic, uh, I would say, uh, the basic uh, context of uh, transatlantic relations, which is based on values and shared uh, experience uh, uh, and shared appreciation for democracy will prevail uh, with uh, both uh, results, but uh, God knows uh, where the world is heading to. I really uh, cannot say more about that than that. Thank you. No, appreciate it. Um, one question by Ronald Luque asks about sort of the implications of COVID and maybe some sort of, you know, restrictions of liberty, lockdowns, right? We've seen some of protests against these. Um, and he wonders if thereby, with the restrictions, if there should be more lockdowns, if um, there would be a comeback of populists that would decry those restrictions on liberty. Uh. Well, um, as much as I hate to predict or extrapolate from data I don't have, um, let's. Let, let, I, I would. I would tackle this. Tackle this question like this. What we can see is that um, populists in uh, some countries are struggling with the anti-corona protests. So, for example, that is the case in Germany. The official line of the party. Um, of the AFD was at first that they support the lockdown measures, uh, but then anti-corona demonstrations popped up and parts of the party took sides with the anti-corona demonstrators. So the party has pretty much shifted until now, although, although there's still struggles going on. Um, there is no one uh, policy on corona uh, among populist radical right parties in Europe. In some countries, they would support harder measures. In some parties, they uh, do not support any measures against corona at all because they claim it's, uh, it's uh, suppressing the liberty of the people. Um, we are all familiar with these arguments. Um, so I would say that um, it depends. In some countries, it could be that the parties are taking sides with, um, with uh, anti-corona protests or anti-corona movements uh, when there will be a second lockdown. However, um, the question is whether it will lead to a uh, populist, um, um, well, increasing in the polls again, because right now, as all opposition parties, they're suffering because there is a rally around the flag effect. I think that depends on the aftermath of Corona. I think first and foremost, that will depend, and this is just an assumption, um, that will depend on economic hardships. Um, if they come up, I think both populist left and right parties could capitalize on that. But again, this is just an assumption. Um, another question, actually, uh, two touch upon that by Luis Hernandez and Shakira Rojas Brizuela ask about sort of the nostalgic appeal, I guess, in Romania in particular, as well as um, the other historical events that maybe reinforce the rise of populist movements. Does anyone want to talk a little bit about more of the appeal of historical nostalgia and the rise of populism? I, I said that before, and um, um, that's that's the key to any authority. One of the fundamental dimensions of authoritarian discourse is a nostalgia of the past, or an authority, or an argument from the past. So, this is something that you see in Orban. This is something that you see in Poland too. I mean, the, 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 whether it's on religious grounds or when on historical grounds, on the Enlightenment and all that, you can see the past. I mean, this is, you can see this in American discourse all the time. So nostalgia is there to stay. The thing that is played on, uh, there is one thing that's interesting and I wanted to mention it in terms of even nostalgia, how it's treated. Media flattens, it, I call it the um, argument of uh, uh, reduction, 
reduction of argument into a binary format, yay, nay, <laughs> yay, nay. So in that sense, you can see praise, blame, but you can also see nostalgia gives directly into, uh, nostalgia gives directly to a solution to be a populist in the sense of participant and a popular need against something called the government. So nostalgia of the past is giving the participants, the audience, this is why it's, it's, it's um, successful. It gives to the audience a sort of a, another justification, another legitimacy to get into the to get into the public sphere, to get into the space. That's one of the triggers. Great. I may add one point. It uh, seems to me uh, that uh, we have uh, not mentioned or even missed uh, the problem of education. Uh, because obviously uh, the question is, what are you going to do with your historical past? Uh, I remember that we all were trained in our national schools in a concept of history that fit into our collective uh, identity. Uh, now maybe we have multiple identities. So I think that in the case of Romania as any other uh, nation state, it would be extremely important to be able to discuss past, this collective uh, narrative, uh, together with others, uh, because certainly I can imagine Hungarian and Romanian narratives uh, can differ in a certain moment, and uh, we can have uh, in the Czech uh, case, Sudeten Germans, uh, if you want to go uh, to the most uh, historically tainted one. And here is, I think, great task to find a way how to deal with the past, uh, how to deal with the fact that past is present, and that. Uh, uh, that it lives in collective memories and can be cultivated, used, and abused by politicians. Great. Thank you. Another question uh, by Professor John Balkir at FIU. She asks about sort of the role of the EU in all of this. And in particular, she wants to know about um, political conditionality, which has been used, right, in the accession process to bring domestic change, you know, liberal change in candidate countries. But we know that there are temporal and geographic limits of what conditionally can do. Um, she wants to hear your opinion about the use of political conditionality in bringing democratic change. And I guess connected to the rise of populism. I have just a quick um, conditionality in terms of audience. I mean, I'm my, my rhetorician, so. Uh, it's in Martin just pointed to some of this. We are no longer just living in a national context, wherever that is. It's also international, global, social media context. So in that sense, um, if you condition, talk about education, if you condition participants to be doing only a yes, no, um, like multiple choice of two choices and no deliberation, no, expansion of the understanding of the context, political conditionality means basically a reduction to a, if I'm not with them, I'm against them. And the them and the we become the, the formula under which uh, we are conditioned to say, um, to say, to opinionate about pol political choice. This is what's gonna happen right now in the States, I think, a yay nay, fundamentally red, blue division, period. Thank you. Another question more specifically asked about the role of immigration, and you touched upon this earlier, right? And um, by C.C. Francis and then Ali Jackman, and they ask, um, sort of, immigration is of course picked up by, by right-wing populists. What about left-wing populists? And Ali Jackman adds to that, um, how would you then in that regard also characterize the role of the French, yellow French Vests and their leftist populism, in particular, so the use of Facebook? I mean, I know this is a lot, but, Let's maybe just focus on sort of the left wing and this reception of immigration. Uh, I'd like to answer uh, the question about immigration. Um, it is pr pretty much uh, the topic of the populist radical right um, uh, over the last well, 20 years, or even more. However, um, at, although we don't um, see the topic tackled by populist left parties so much uh, because they have an inclusionary approach, why, whereas the populist radical right has an exclusionary approach to um, who the people are, um, you, you can see that after the European refugee crisis, the so-called refugee crisis, 
populist left parties in part are struggling with the topic because parts of their electorate have relatively authoritarian uh, values when it comes to immigrants or immigration. Now that the now with the with the so-called refugee crisis, this um, this topic or the salience of the topic in the public discourse and thus also for the voting decision has increased, and that posed a problem to the populist left parties. Um, who, um, in terms of the elites, don't want to tackle um, their, uh, this problem, but for part of their electorate, uh, that does indeed, ma indeed matter. Uh, and I would say that this problem is not solved yet in terms of the populist left parties. Uh, can I give you one uh, very uh, bizarre example? Uh, in the Czech Republic, uh, because of, I would say, historical reasons in the 70s uh, and early 1980s, we have quite strong uh, Vietnamese uh, minority. And uh, there is a surprisingly no problem uh, between even Czech populists and this uh, minority coming from uh, very far away from Asian context. Uh, they have their own wo world. Uh, they have their own, I would say, uh, skills and moral codes uh, that are relatively, I would say, uh, positively appreciated by Czechs. But it's not so much a question of uh, I would say, uh, difference, but uh, sometimes people feel threatened by something, and uh, sometimes uh, this foreign thing is uh, relatively acceptable and even enriching uh, elements in a society. So again, what I'm calling for, we need first to uh, think uh, through about uh, these things. Uh, in the Czech case, why uh, there is still an uh, ongoing problem with Roma, minority in the Czech Republic. It's not migration. Uh, they like to move around. They were uh, a little bit mobile element in our society. And still there is something that can be easily turned into a, a hatred and into uh, some sort of war or conflict. And we need and we are trying to take it uh, into consideration and do something about that. Thank you. And, you know, aside from that point that you, I think, just made about sort of understanding, right, sort of some of the underlying processes that may spur uh, political movements, the last question that I, where I'm trying to merge two um, people's questions into one because of time would be sort of, you know, what can be done about it? So one would it be in terms of the strategy, would it be to acknowledge the movement, condemn or ignore it? And I think we heard diverging opinions here from the panelists and also a little bit related to sort of like is Facebook maybe would there need to be restrictions on Facebook or social media because of the misinformation so what can be done about it I know that's a big topic but maybe concludingly if you can just each of you just uh, give us your thoughts thank you it's actually the one question that is always asked on such a panel and that no scientists can respond to in a in a, in a proper way but we have to right uh, because this is the million dollar question. So um, what, what we see is that there are different strategies out there and a lot of them have been tested. Demonization, and I'm talking about strategies by the other political actors, the so-called mainstream parties. We call them mainstream parties in the literature. Um, um, uh, demonization, um, cooperation, uh, any for, uh, anything in between, ignoring, uh, ignoring these parties and there's no one size fits all strategy. There just isn't. Um, including them in parliament um, has been like in many talks um, in, in the early emergence of the, of the AFD in 2013 has been an argument as to which that this will like um, demystify the political party, the populist party. Well, in some cases it worked, for example, in, in uh, the participation of the FPÖ in Austria in the early 2000s. In other cases, it did not work at all. So, um, but when it comes to the question of whether there, are, there can be any institutional responses, um, I'm very, very reluctant from a normative per perspective because um, I think, well, this is an experience I made in several public discussions. We, we're often very quick with discussing uh, restrictions of freedom of speech. And I think this is from a normative perspective, highly problematic. Um, and the other is that um, institutions uh, can't really respond to these parties other than banning them in order to, uh, to be um, parties that need to be banned. These parties in, in most countries, uh, if there is such a thing as party bans, such as in Germany, they need to be extremists. And not even the AFD um, um, right now at this point in time 
is overall an extremist party, such as the, the former NPD was, or the NPD is. Thank you. Uh, one last word from Professor Palush or Marin. Well, uh, I think that uh, certainly uh, the problem cannot or should not be ignored. Uh, something has to be done about that. What comes to my mind are um, uh, positive examples in our part of the world uh, from the past. For instance, a so-called ecumenic dialogue uh, between uh, churches, between Catholic Church and Protestant churches, uh, that they had a lot of issues uh, in our historical context in the past. And this dialogue turned out to be very creative, very productive and very interesting. Uh, so the problem is that if both sides, so both parties are just repeating and now some, uh, they're already pre, uh, prepared judgment uh, instead of trying to understand. I think the increase of capacity of understanding is uh, the main task. Thank you. And Professor Marin, last but not least. Mine was, um, was uh, along similar things about education. One of the things that struck me uh, as uh, fundamentally missing is in terms of a solution. And I agree with Marcel, there's a one million, million, two million dollar question, just to add to it, um, is that actually uh, the, the schism between populist and non-populist parties is uh, produced even more by making this difference rather than trying to understand and create some reflection of what works and what doesn't work in terms of the participation, political participation. The lack of dialogue is huge. The lack of education for a debate, a deliberative format, rather than praise blame. If you're not like with me, you're against me. And, and that is something that we all need to do, including academics in our own writings. I mean, I would like to see writings in which you say some of the things that involve public participation in populist discourse can carry something it says something about the people and we have to accept that and learn about it and reflect on it. So for all of us, it's a lesson that we have to be a little bit humble about it, I think. Great. Thank you so much. Um, you almost answered not all, but, uh, but most of the questions, um, I think you definitely gave us plenty of food for thought. And um, I want to thank all of you, the panelists. I want to thank Christine Kali and the tech team from FIU as well, as well as the audience for participating. Thank you very much. And just check for another Jean Monnet Center um, event, which is coming fairly soon. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thanks again.